too many advisors, I don't know, for lack of a better word, will say whatever their client wants in order to keep them. Oh, you don't like the strategy? We'll go over here. Uh, oh, you don't want stocks? We'll go to bonds. You don't want bonds? We'll go to stocks. Rather than say, here's the right thing. We built the plan for you to achieve your goals. No, we need to stick with it. We're not going to be right all the time, but if we're right two thirds of the time, you've got a pretty good portfolio that's really going to work for you and it's going to do the things you want. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Connected Advisor. I'm your host, Kyle Van Pelt, co founder and CEO of Mile Marker. And today I am joined by Ted Bovard. Ted is one of the founding members and he is the CEO of the Fort Pitt Capital Group out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, they are a wonderful RIA up there in the Northeast in the great state of Pennsylvania that is serving clients in a really unique and interesting way that I'm so excited to talk with Ted about today. So Ted, thank you so much for joining the show. Oh, absolutely, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Of course, we're glad to have you. So Ted, I start every one of these podcast episodes off with the same question. This one's not going to be any different. In the time that I've been in this industry, I have found that everybody kind of has their own unique path to working in financial services and particularly wealth management. Some people's path might be a little bit more traditional. Some people maybe a little bit more untraditional. But what I have found is everybody who sits in your seat had a moment in their life, we call it their money moment, where something kind of clicked it happened to them and they said, this is what I want to do with my career. This is what I want to do to serve people. And so for you, I'm curious, Ted, what was your money moment that brought you into the wealth management industry? Oh, it's a great question. Mine may be a little, a little strange and maybe yet very familiar depending on where folks started. I am um, the last of nine kids. Oh, wow. Uh, son of a doctor and a nurse. And so I started at the University of Pittsburgh with the idea that I would follow my dad's footsteps as being a medical doctor since none of us, none of the other eight had gone down this road. So had you know, shown the aptitude and thought, okay, this would be the way, because I'd always talked about helping people in some capacity. That was my fascination. Spent a year at Pitt, everything was fine, grades were fine. Had a conversation with him, uh, my dad, in, in August before my sophomore year. And said, Dad, you know, I really I like it. I, I don't love it, though. Maybe you, know, you could point me in a different direction or a specialty that I might like better. He said, well, what do you think you want to do? I said, well, I thought more maybe, you know, psychiatry. He said, well, let's get you a good psychiatrist. Thinking that was pretty funny. I was like, what? Uh, he goes, no, you're, you're going to take on a lot of people's burdens. You said, maybe, you know, there's a different way. He said, did you take anything else when you were in school? I said, well. I only took one elective. I took economics. He goes, money. Mm. People need help with their money. You can help people with their money. And I thought about it. I was like, okay, I really had, kind of hadn't thought that. I, I kind of like the idea of that. He said, well, think about it. See what you want to do. I literally add drop my entire schedule and went to economics with minors in psychology and philosophy with the idea of studying behavior, understanding how people think, and then applying that. I didn't know exactly where, but something along the the financial line. So it turned out to be fairly pivotal for me because my dad passed away that following December. So pivotal moment in my life, not realizing how pivotal that was probably until you know, 10 or 12 years later, having been in the industry and, and have kind of done this. And it's a helpful path that you can help guide people on. And it makes a not like medicine does, but makes a material difference in their lives day to day. So that was probably, that was probably my, my moment, but I didn't realize it was my moment until much later in time. So that is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. As I heard you talking about that, I, I don't know why, but I, I just immediately started thinking about behavioral finance and, and behavioral psychology as it relates to this industry. So I know you kind of pivoted from, hey, I'm interested in psychology to, to economics and coming into this, but did that sort of interest in psychology carry over into what you're doing now? Do you feel like that's that's something that you're really implementing at Four Pit? Oh, for sure. That that to me probably is much more, probably is much more of an interest of mine was the way people think and not so much in trying to you know drive their behavior one way or another, but understand their behavior so that I could then help them. So you know, looking at, at sitting down with someone and hearing about their dreams, their goals, 
uh, what they want for their kids or how they're trying to help their parents. You have to kind of understand what's in there as well as understand what happens when the market goes down 25 or 30 percent and what triggers inside them and how to how to help them, how to assist them, how to be a comfort, how to be firm and keep them on track, because that's that's how you're going to get the best results. A hundred percent. I started my career in this industry at uh, Riskalyze, now known as Nitrogen, but formerly Riskalyze. And I feel like that was a huge piece of what we talked about all the time. And, you know, back then now, which is a, about a decade ago, you know, it, it was this huge focus on me and how do we, how do we get the, the conversations with our clients to, away from returns and focused on the, the, the financial plan and on the goals and all of that type of stuff. And while I think that's been a big push, I still think there's so much focus on on returns and things like that. Do you think that is because the psychology, I'd be curious to hear you riff a little bit on what does it take to transform conversations away from just returns from the portfolio onto the plan itself and succeeding in the plan, regardless of what the returns look like? Yeah, and that, that's uh, it's a battle we face a lot because the preponderance of financial news out there that people are getting focus all on returns. Is it the index? Is it NVIDIA? Is it uh, Apple? Is it it's returns, returns, returns? And so I think there's a, this, this tendency to want to chase with the idea that, well, if I get the returns I want, I don't really care about the rest of it. And we try to set a completely different expectation. It's kind of probably how we work people through our steps is to set a different expectation about, hey, if we can get you to accomplish all the goals you have, whatever they are, and we don't need to chase those things. And you're not beholden to the day-to-day -day swings of the market or even the month-to-month -month or quarter to quarter or year to year. I think we're going to make a material difference in, in what you do and in your financial lives and set you on a different path where you don't have all that anxiety of, do I have the latest and greatest thing? This is an industry, as you probably know, where people want to tell people that they own NVIDIA or what you name it, Tesla, when it's the hottest stock. You know, it could have been you know, in the late 1990s, it could have been Corning. It could have been UDS, you know, or your JDS Uniphase. It could have, I mean, all these companies that people just wanted to tell their friends they owned. And yet when they got crushed, there was no more conversation. And for us, it's like, move away from that. If I can get you there and I can do it at 70% of the risk through diversification and making the adjustments and having the portfolio do what you need, as opposed to this this game where you're playing chase all the time. Yes. I think your, your odds of success go up exponentially. I mean, you've been in the business, so you've seen it. It's a tough thing because they're constantly bombarded with who's the greatest this week or this day or, or this minute. It's just, we try to get people away from the sprint and to really focus on the marathon because that's, that's what it is. That's so good. That's so good. Because I also think, you know, one of the interesting conversations that's really popped up maybe in the past year or two that I'm very passionate about is helping these clients who've had success actually spend their money, right? Because you get so focused on how much you're accumulating and how the returns are accumulating and, and you build that muscle to save, 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 that it's very difficult to turn on a dime and, and be able to spend this money that you've saved, right? And that, you, that you've enjoyed. So um, I've heard some really cool things where it's like, hey, your, your target return to hit your goals is, you know, whatever, 6%. And so, you know, let's say you hit 8% or something like that. The advisor will say, hey, I'm taking this extra 2%. Like, let's go do one of these big things that you've been talking about. You want to go on that big Mediterranean cruise or you want to do that or whatever. Like, we, we hit our goal for the plan. Take this money and spend it, right? Or, or things along those lines. I'd be curious to hear you talk about that a little bit too from a, a psychology perspective and, a, and, a, and as, a, as a wonderful advisor of, hey, we're hitting the goal. We're hitting the plan. Like, let, let me help you spend some of this money too, because you, you've gotten so good at the actual muscle of saving, which is the hardest thing for so many of these people to learn. Right. Again, I think some of the expectation you set as we're hey. building out and just say it's a retirement plan and you've got folks who've worked for 40, 45 years and you're right, they've only seen this go one direction. They keep feeding it, feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. And then they get there and they're afraid to actually spend it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. This is why you built this other business. You built this other business to give you back the money that you put in so you can enjoy it and do the things you've talked about for the last 40, 45 years where you haven't had the one thing, which is time, yeah. in order to do that. Achieving that balancing act is, it's different for everyone, but it, and we have clients that literally can take, oh man, two or three years to kind of settle into that. Okay. It's okay to spend my own money. I yeah. mean, it's just, it's a, it's kind of backwards or, or uh, you know, I've got one, I've got a, a couple, I've, we've become good friends as well, but we've worked together for over 30 years 
And she will constantly laugh and say, hey, are we allowed to spend Ted's money? And I'm like, whoa, this isn't Ted's money. This is your money. You guys have done a great job. And so, you know, he, you know her husband will call me. He goes, I had to call to see if we're allowed to spend any. I'm like, you guys need to spend them. You need to enjoy it. No one strikes a balancing act perfect. But you've got to have a plan that says, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to spend the money. Our job is to keep you on track. I will tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you if I think we're moving off track. Which again is also the tough part of that job because then you have people who go the other way and they're like, oh, oh. they go, all right, let's temper this a little bit. We might be coming off the rails a bit. But it's to be that advisor who doesn't just say what they want to hear, but says something about what's going to really make it work. Because I, I care about their success. I want it to be everything they thought it would be and then some. That's so great. So you've had a pretty successful run at Fort Pitt Capital. And in our research for this, you can correct me if, the, if this is wrong, but in 28 years as a firm, uh, it looks to us like only two advisors have voluntarily left your firm, which is which is pretty impressive. I think it might be four. Okay, four. Still, but Still not bad over 28 years. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I think, I think it, when I looked at that number, I, I had to work back through it. I'm going... Uh, it might be a little more than that. So just so we don't get in, I don't, I don't have any of those people calling me back going, Hey, Ted, <laughs> remember that time. Yeah. But, but the, the point still stands that you've had an, an incredibly low turnover, especially not to sugarcoat it in an industry where advisors move all the time for all kinds of different reasons. So the, the point of this is you've had incredibly low turnover. Why do you think that is like, what have you done at Fort Pitt to create a culture where advisors want to stay and they want to be loyal and they, they aren't turning over or hop into different teams every couple of years? I would say it's got to come back to our values. So, you know, the founding members and of which, you know, I still have one of them here, Mike Lehar. One of the things we've always kind of done is we've built this, you know, the values of who we are, the way we think. And then as people come in to try to just ingrain that, hopefully they already have a lot of it. And we've been very fortunate to find people that have those same values, but with the ones who don't, or they're just trying to figure it out, you know, we go down through them and we repeat them a bunch and it's simple. They're five. It's our clients are first uh, and people say that and they, you know, it's like, oh yeah, of course everybody says that. I go, but you come through the firm and talk to people and they'll go, you know, I love the fact that you hear these story after story about, you know, trying to live that value. And it's, and it's tough because there is a lot of money and there's a lot of other distractions and other things that happen. But we've always said, look, if we can take care of our clients. It takes care of everything else. So if we start with that, that's great. Then we've got to be solutions focused, figure out what's the best thing. Is it, is it their retirement plan? Is it educating their children? These days, is it taking care of their parents? Because a lot of things have flipped the other way. But whatever those things are, how do we get a solution for them that works? Taking initiative, and that's at every phase in here. Yes, we've got a great process. This really works well. Someone says, you know what? I think we can make this better. And they may not be in that department. They may be in another department and say, oh my goodness, I saw this. What if we did this? It's that idea of let's not be complacent. How do we make changes so that the planning's better? Because then the end results are better for our clients as well. We always talk about all being in this together. So whether it's something as simple as the dishes in the kitchen, whether it's as complicated as I've got someone who's got complicated trusts and I've not seen this as often or I've not seen this in a while, let me talk to somebody else in here who can help me figure it out. And they will freely give up their time and their energy so that, again, at the end of the day, our clients are in the best position. And then, you know, finally, you know, whether you call a follow through, I call it, you know, we do what we say we're going to do. So if I tell you that I'm in, I'm going to get this thing done, that I need to get it done. I need to be accountable for that. And accountability, which seems to be a fairly you know, popular word these days, is something that we've just kind of stressed here and said, this is part of who we are. I've got to be accountable to my clients, I've got to be accountable to my partners, I've got to be accountable to all my colleagues. If they need me to do something, I've got to be there. I've got to show up and I've got to do it. And I think we've been very, very blessed in just finding so many people that share those that it's not like you're really trying to teach it and ingrain it. They already have it or they have most of them. They're attracted, I think, to coming here and staying here because they see those things being lived out and they get to live them out. And there's, there's a lot of positive you know, chemistry and energy that comes out of that, as you know, and you get people pulling in the same direction, it works. And quite frankly, if you have somebody, and you probably have seen this happen too, where they're not there, it kind of self-selects. So instead of you having to go, hey, you know, this isn't working out, we got to talk, they're kind of going, you know, I don't know that this is the right place for me. And that's okay. That's okay. But 
I don't want to compromise for anybody else. And we figured the best thing we can do is try our best to live it. And we're not perfect in any way. And, but we, we definitely take it to heart every day that this is who we are and how we drive. And I think that has been both attractive for people coming in. I think it's, it's helped not only our, our staff stay, but I think our clients have seen that because we talk about it when we do our client events, we push up, this is what we do and you can hold us accountable for this. And if you're not getting an answer from whoever it is you're talking to, I said, you have my number because we're in this together. That, that I think is what's had the, probably the most power for us over the years. Again, I don't know that we knew this when we started this in 1995, that these were going to be our values. I think I just, like I said, we're very blessed with the original seven folks that we, that we just, we put our heads down and we, and we went to work like this, figuring that if we put our clients at the forefront of what we do and all the other things behind it, that it would take care of itself. That's so great, man. I really appreciate you going deep on that because I do think this is an industry with a lot of turnover for several reasons, right? Some, you know, not always bad. And I love that you tied it back to your core values too, because that's one thing that I think has been interesting for me as I've gone through this space is I think every, every business has core values. It's a question of whether or not the businesses actually, you know, live according to those core values or if they're just something that you put up on the wall as a poster, but it's not something that actually impacts the day to day of the company. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because one of the things we talked about was you know, the whole idea of, you know, do you put it on the poster? Do you put it on the wall? And I'm like, maybe that's not a bad reminder. I said, but I think a better reminder is if we are literally talking about it. So someone coming in here in the interview, like our, our HR person, Kate's kind of go through what the values are probably in, in, in the first conversation with someone just to say, look, this is who we are. And you know, they're going to hear it again. I, I try to get folks who've been here for the first three to six months out to lunch and we sit down so they can ask me any questions that they have. But I also usually go through those values and I may take a few more minutes on one or two of them just to talk about what that means. So saying, hey, we put clients first and then just moving on is not, no, what does that mean? What does that look like? What's both success and what's failure when I talk about we're all in this together? Because I, I've done it. I've messed up. I've missed that opportunity. And you learn from that. I said, so the key is keep learning, keep pushing towards those things. And then it's a, it's a better culture for everyone. People want to, want to come to work. We spend a lot of time here. We might as well enjoy you know, the time we spend and the people we spend it with. Well stated. So, okay. I want to transition a little bit into at least from what we've seen, some of the mechanisms that you all have used to grow, which looks like uh, two C's, right? It's custodial referrals and it's content creation from what we've seen. And, and you were quoted in an article about your ability to uh, really leverage custodial referrals in such a positive way. How do those allow you to leverage those values that you're talking about in the strengths of Fort Pitt Capital? It's great when you have great partners. And so when you look at the custodian, you look at the, the Schwabs and the Fidelities of the world, we always look at it like not what they can do for us, but how can we come alongside and partner with them and give their clients more depth and breadth and at the same time, maybe help them because a lot of them have very, very large books they've got to service and take care of. And it's not easy to do. So saying, hey, instead of what can you do for me or how can you get me more business or we come in and say, look, how can we help you guys? How about if we bring our uh, chief investment officer in? periodically and just tell you what we see going on out there. What if we bring our social security specialist in? Would that help any of your clients or your conversations with clients? How about if we brought in you know, some of the business sales? You've got some business owners who are probably at some point anticipating needing to sell a business. How about if we bring our one of our experts in and we talk about that or put a team without asking for a thing, just saying, how can we help you? And I think that's really through those relationships, particularly in, in Pittsburgh, obviously, we've, we've had the best relationships because that's where we're we're based. Yep. But even as we start to talk about the folks across the country, you know, nationally, it's about building that relationship, but it's offering that help, not saying, what can you give me? And I think too many times people go in and go, hey, if I don't get X number of referrals by this time without these many dollars, and they have all this matrix they put in that, they look at it like it's a fair. And I said, well, what's your time frame on doing that? If you're going in with that, again, that sprint mentality, I think you're not going to do that well. I think if you go in with the marathon, mentality, you're going to, you're going to build something, but you're building relationships. Like they can help you, you can help them. And again, we, there's so many great folks in those, you know, those branches that it's just, they're looking for the help and it just becomes a great relationship, a great partnership. So great. This podcast is brought to you by Turncast. We make game-changing content for fintech and financial services companies. 
Learn more at turncast.com. On the content creation side, you have this wonderful YouTube video that we saw when we were researching for this, which was like when to hire or fire an advisor. Can you kind of talk to us about, you know, where that idea came from and then maybe some of the key points of that video? We sit down and we have great marketing people. So Miranda heads up our marketing. And I mean, she is wonderful at idea suggestion. Mike and I, again, because we've been at this a long time, we both came out of the sales side of it, if you will. It's different things like titles that are, you know, like that, when to hire and fire. And people are like, what? Yeah, it's like, that's that's a little different. Or I think we had one that, you know, rather than talk about estate planning, they're like, or what people need to know when I die or what happens after, because they're just, they're subjects people are thinking about, but not quite sure how to put them. The hire and firing advisors is tough because most people go, oh, that's, you know, that's so you're just selling your, your business in another way. I'm like, well, you are, or you're pointing out kind of expectations that people should have no matter who the advisor is. And we have some great other advisors, great competitors in town that I see all the time. And I mean, they're, I'd recommend them if I didn't, you know, run corporate capital group, but they're good advisors and they're good people. And I'll have clients will come through and say, well, you know, I saw this, I saw your webinar and, and thought maybe I just sh should talk to you and see if you take a look at what they're doing. They start to talk about the relationship. I'm like, I think you're in pretty good shape. And they're like, you don't want my business? No, that's not it. It sounds like you've got a relationship that works. If that changes, let me know because it's about building that relationship with someone who's going to help you reach those goals and objectives. But it's setting those expectations and that pathway to do it. So yes, I think we've got a I think we've got a great way of doing that. But I think there are other people out there that also do, and and I don't ever want to be disrespectful for them because I've seen it, I've seen their results, and they've been good. And we're one of those firms that are comfortable to tell you you're you're in good shape. Your folks are doing a good job for you. And if it's a second opinion, you just got a good one and, uh, you know, thank them for, for doing the right things for you. Unfortunately, as you probably know, that's not usually the case. No. And that's always tough because you feel a lot of people feel like they've lost years of, of their lives. Mm. They're not going to be able to recover. They're not going to do those things. And we, we're like, look, let's start where we are right now. Let's talk about where we are and where you need to go. And let's take those first next whatever those next steps are, that's what we've got to worry about. Can't live looking at the past and wishing I would have, could have, and should have, because we're not going to get very far if we do it. Let's build a game plan and help you get there and then set up a way to keep track of this so that you don't get off the path. Or if you want to get off the path and it's the, it's the wrong decision, we're here to tell you, let's not do that. Yeah. That was probably one of the bigger ones is just too many advisors, I don't know, for lack of a better word, will say whatever their client wants in order to keep them. Oh, you don't like the strategy? We'll go over here. Uh, oh, you don't want stocks? We'll go to bonds. You don't want bonds? We'll go to stocks. Rather than say, here's the right thing. We built the plan for you to achieve your goals. No, we need to stick with it. We're not going to be right all the time. But if we're right two thirds of the time, you've got a pretty good portfolio that's really going to work for you. And it's going to do the things you want. So well stated. I love that. So we've been talking a little bit about how for pit brings clients in or how you get the pipeline going. I also think in our research, we found you guys have a pretty solid five-step onboarding process for clients as they decide to come and work with Fort Pitt. And I think client onboarding is a huge topic in the industry. It's something I think everybody's trying to figure out how to get really done really well, because it's a lot of paperwork. You know, Lots of firms love to talk about their client experience, but man, it's really hard to show off your client experience in the onboarding piece because it can be a, a, a very tumultuous process. So Pat, tell us a little bit about your patented five-step client onboarding process that uh, gets things off on the right foot. So what we tried to build was we tried to build a way to begin that relationship. Because again, it's, it's a relationship and it's not something, I can't expect someone to walk in one day, meet me and say, hey, let me turn over $4 million to you today. Thank you. You'll let me know what we're going to do later on, right? And out the door they go. I mean, it'd be great. I just, you know, I think my, you know, my personality is mildly effervescing, but I don't think it's that. So yep. I don't think nope. I would do that. <laughs> so what we've, what we've done is said, let's, let's start out by gathering, let's have a conversation. Okay. Let's get to know you. Let's ask the questions. And we go through a, a, a quite a bit of questions, questionnaires. Then we gather the data, try to formulate all There's usually more conversations during that. Cause there's always question marks and concerns, confusion over, Wait, you said about this account, is this here? What do you want to do here? Oh no, these are the stocks I got from my, my, my grandfather. 
you know, I don't want to do anything with them, but I'd like you to take a look and just make sure there's nothing you know, terrible there. You know, other things like pieces like that. We take all that together, put it together into a game plan, whether it's an investment plan, financial plan, try to cover all the topics that they, they wanted, the big concerns that they had, whether it's retirement or education, or, you know, as I said, you know, one of the ones we're seeing more often is helping parents. If it's insurance, if it's a business succession planning that they also need, we may not run down all of those roads in the first plan because that can be a little overwhelming, but we're going to build a structure that says, here's how we're going to work through these pieces so that we can put this thing together. We put it in writing and we give it to them and say, okay, take a look at this. And then let's sit down and decide if we're a good fit for you. If this mm. is what you want to do in the path you want to go. Some of these things we can actually start to implement right away. Some of them are going to take a conversation with your estate attorney. They're going to take a conversation with your accountant. We'll coordinate all those things. Ones with maybe a, a business succession planner, whatever those pieces are. But we've put together the game plan for them to follow. And then our job is to, to you know, to use a, a football analogy, quarterback them through it so that they've got someone who knows what's happening, can speak the language, and keeps that the ball moving forward. So good. Once all that's done, and they say, yes, we want to start the relationship, then it's you know the paperwork and the administrative to get all those things going. And then the, the last step, which I think is probably most critical, and you know people are always surprised by that. They say, oh, no, I, I thought you were telling us what to do would be most critical. I said, no, what's most critical now is to keep you on track. So doing that with a regular set of reviews, whether it's once a year, twice a year, what, you know, there are years where it'll be five times a year. It's to keep that process moving forward so that you don't make a mistake or get off that path at exactly the worst time. And yet at the same time, we've got to be accountable for those returns. We've got to be accountable for the results of what we're doing. Are we moving towards that retirement projection we put together so that you can retire early or late or with X amount of dollars to, to live on and enjoy. That is really well articulated. And I think you nailed so many portions of that. I especially love the beginning part of it, which is uh, expecting somebody to come in and just hand everything probably. over and go, all right, you got it. I'll see you later. We well, hear those stories. You probably hear them. And I, I like, I'm amazed, man, I can't, I don't know that I can do anything like that, but maybe that's just the way my processor works. But, you know, people come in and they'll tell me stories like, oh yeah, well, we walked in there and they said, yeah, we're going to, We'll do everything just to sign, start signing the paperwork or do whatever. I said, well, when did they tell you what they were going to do? And they said, well, you know, they've never really articulated that until later. And then if I soon as I asked a question, then they would change and say, oh, we can do something different. I'm like, okay. Um, I mean, we're going to build a plan, but it's, it's what we're doing is we're building it out of conviction. So, I mean, if something changes, it's because, it's because something in your life has changed that necessitates we go back and relook at the plan and we make those adjustments. With how Fort Pitt has grown and the success that you've had, you've been onboarding a lot of people. You are managing relationships with a lot of households. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about how you're leveraging technology to accomplish all of that, right? So Mile Marker is a technology company. We we right. love all of the wealth tech in the space. So, you know, Ted, as you guys are are helping people stay on track with those plans and and trying to provide that just-in-time financial advice. Talk to me a little bit about the technology that you're leveraging to help you all be successful in that regard. We used to joke early on in our, our lives at Fort Pitt that our number one most expensive employee was technology because if there was a better system for asset management, if there was a better system for the CRM, for our client relationship management, if there were better systems for understanding patterns of not just in the markets, but patterns in behavior, that we could, we could utilize and see and just having the ability. I mean, I, okay. one of the things I'm probably most proud of is that right before COVID, we had already had rolled out teams. We had already rolled out a lot of things that we weren't using a ton before then because we have a, we have a group of people you know, on, our, on our tech team who were always kind of looking forward to say, hey, this could actually be an issue that we probably ought to think about. We should think about what you do here. So whether it's the the portfolio management systems like Orion or Tamarack, or and we use we use Orion, but all of them are good. We're constantly looking to make sure they're the best. If it's red black on trading, you know, the, our CRM system was through the Microsoft Selenica, whatever that variation is at the time. And we're constantly looking to improve. I think we drive our our tech people crazy because you know I'm like, okay, that's great. Is there a better system? And they're like, we just did that like two years ago. I said, right, but is there a better system? I mm. said, the only the only constant we have is change. So yeah. 
if we're not looking to get better and it's one of our largest you know budgetary items always because we've got to we've got to figure out how we can deliver the best and the great thing is as you know the technology changes constantly all the time so you can't ever get okay i think we're good for five years or what you can never say that this guy but we're good for at least this year maybe and yeah. depends because you could be rolling something out in the middle of rolling it out they make adjustments and changes so it's fun to have worked in an industry that really i think has has utilized technology in just some unbelievable ways not necessarily maybe faster or sooner but because of how popular how much information there is on money and people's money and how many programs and well, I used to, used to say magazines, they don't do it anymore, but <laughs> you look at all the, the shows and everything devoted to it, people have just gotten so much better. I started this business in 1987, literally got my crash course in the uh, fall of 1987. But to think about, you know, it was a big deal to have a fax machine and the ability to, to go to trading that is free. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Systems that are immediate. You know, they just went to T plus one, you know, on the clearing. I mean, it, it's incredible. And that's all because of technology. So if you're sitting here and you're fighting that and you're in this industry, you you will miss out on, on the opportunities. And us, it leverages so that we can have with our teams the abilities for people to do more and not be hopefully too overwhelmed because their number of clients looks like a big number. And, and people yeah. have all kinds of matrix on that as statistics. And we probably look a little different only because we, I think we build out the technology and we build out the team structure that I think has helped everyone be able to continue to deliver, you know, and meet those expectations that our clients have. Talk about that team structure a little bit. So how, how have you built that out? How does that help you serve uh, the amount of clients you do? Yeah. So, so what we do is we try to, rather than look at it, like, you know, I've got, you know, Ted and Ted's got, you know, maybe one administrative person or he works with, you know, shares one. We've tried to look at, building out teams where you've got maybe a lead advisor with that lead advisor, you may have a couple, one or two associate advisors or newer advisors, or you know, still building their book advisors. And then maybe behind them, we, we have what's called a service advisor, which helps you know navigate through the planning system. And then we have our, you know, our client specialists that do, you know, whether it's administrative, but also handle a lot of the moving of money and do these other things. So you end up with this kind of this almost a diamond type structure where you can utilize, you know, all the people. So I, I may only have two meetings that day and, and one of my you know, other colleagues may have two or three, but we can share different resources because there's, there's efficiencies there. But at the same time, you've got the way for, if they've got a question or you've got a question, you've got an immediate team to talk to about something. Rather than sitting for everybody waiting for Ted to get back to you on whatever, you might have Emily get back to you with an answer or Skylar, and, and they're up to speed on the clients. They know what's going on, but it tends to leverage out. And, and in our minds, you get the best of the best. So I don't need to know all the pieces about this because, I, like I said, I've got Skylar or I've got an Emily. But they say, oh, you know, what do you think in this situation? You can do those things so that when your client kind of is, a, is at the center of that diamond and they get the best of all these people's thoughts. And hopefully from a leverage standpoint, what we've seen is it tends not to burn people out. You, know, you can take a vacation and you can take a vacation. I'll cover your calls. I can be out of the office and know that someone's going to get back to the clients. They're going to take care of what it is. And most times they don't need me anyway. Some of them may not want me, quite frankly, but uh, some of them don't need me for sure. So that's so good. What you're doing is you're being very intentional and thoughtful about how to scale the client experience and serve more clients. Because I think, I don't know, it, it's interesting. I think our industry has been talking about firms like 4Pit being able to serve, like technology enabling you to serve more clients forever. But for some reason, the thought always goes to being able to serve, you know, maybe small account clients or things like that. A lot of that conversation came in when all the robo-advisors were all of the rage. But right. the reality is there are there are lots of clients that are ideal fits for most RIAs, a million dollar plus, you know, two million dollar plus clients that are just not being served yet. And and there's such a demand for it and there's such a supply of it. And firms like Four Pit have to be able to serve, you know, more than whatever the traditional number of households was in order to to meet the demand for financial advice. I think to make a difference, and I don't don't have a problem with the robo advisor, but when they were first being rolled out, one of the big feedbacks was Okay, that's great. What gets communicated when the markets go down? What happens when something goes down? So think about this. I don't want to use small in that term. I'm going to use probably less experienced investors getting started. 
they've not ridden through one or two ups and downs. They've not seen some of these things. They probably don't want to do a lot with it. They just know they've got to, they've got to participate. So to have no one there to talk to them, the first time it turns down and it, and it will, is going to be tough. They're going to go, oh, you know what? Yeah, this doesn't work. I mean, think about how many folks in 2008 and 9, 401k participants who stopped participating in their 401k because they had just now lost almost all the money that they had put in over the previous five or six years. And they thought, oh, you know what? This really doesn't work. I'll have to figure this out some other way and stopped contributing. I was amazed in 2009 and 10 when people were going, oh, yeah, I stopped putting money in my 401k. I'm like, oh, now's the time to be putting as much money into your 401k as you can. It just got cheaper. If you were looking for the sale, the sale signs up. This is when you buy, not when you not when you sell or you don't participate. But they were like, oh, you know, they're in their mid thirties. I, I'd never anyone to talk to. No one told me that. That's why you, back to you and I were talking about the behavioral side of it. That's what to me is so critical: setting those expectations about behavior because these are needs people have. Whether you've got ten thousand dollars or you've got ten million, behaviorally they're not a whole lot different. Your experience is different, probably yes. The problems are different for sure. They're more complicated, but it doesn't mean you don't need to have someone there who can help you and answer those questions and tell you, no, 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 don't do that. That's not what you want to do here and have a reason why. I love it. That's so good. All right. So we're going to move into our final two segments of the show. Uh, This one, I love to ask people, and I think yours is going to be insightful, but Ted, I'd love you to get out your crystal ball and think about what the industry is going to look like maybe five years from now into the future. What do you think is going to be different? What do you think we're going to be seeing? That can be from a technology perspective. It can be from a process, whatever you want. Like You're unlimited on this, but just get out that crystal ball and tell us what the future of the space looks like. I think the future, I think with AI and some of the things that we're going to be able to do with technology I think that the leveraging things that you and I just talked about are going to even be better. They're going to be bigger, but I think it's going to take, I think it's going to take some different people to, to manage that. It may take people who are much more technologically savvy than maybe some of the, the older, you know, dinosaurish kind of people who've been around a long time, who know enough about it, but maybe don't necessarily see that as well. I think that's, I think tech is still the, the game changer across the board and people's abilities to use it, utilize it both for understanding their clients better, but I think also just making sure that they're getting the solutions their clients want. What that looks like is, I I mean, we we didn't have one screen when I started. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at two. We have people in our office who have three or four. You know, I just, I always equate and I go, what do I have to do to get more than one screen? (laughs) It's just like, but it's leveraging all these things so that they can look and and navigate that. I think it's going to be people who have, who have better vision on that side. That's so good. Awesome, man. Okay, now, final segment of the show. We call this the Mile Marker Minute, Ted. So it's kind of like a lightning round series of questions, a little bit more lighthearted, trying to get to know you besides uh, as the owner of a firm. So the goal is to try and have all of the questions answered in a minute or less. So do you think you're up to the challenge? I don't know. This is tough. Hold on. Hold on. Let me one more sip of coffee. I'll be ready. (laughs) All right, right. let's go for it. First question for you. If you could travel anywhere in the world that you have never traveled to before, where would you travel? Tokyo. Tokyo. That's a great one. That's high on my list too. Okay, perfect. What is the best book that you have read in the last 12 calendar months? The Dysfunctions of a Team. Patrick Lencioni? Yep. Very good. Highly good recommend Lencioni for anybody listening to this. He's oh, got a bunch of great books. What is the most underrated thing about Pittsburgh for people who maybe have never traveled there before? Underrated. Oh, boy. I think people don't know how much the city has changed from the old view that so many folks have and the fact that uh, people are still neighbors here. They miss that. They're neighbors. I have a neighbor who plows my driveway for me if I'm not up in time. I mean, it's, I love that. I, I Maybe the other places haven't, but I think that's something people don't know. It's just, it's still, you know, it's still an old neighborhood in a lot of respects. That's fantastic. All right. Uh, give me your prediction on what the Steelers record is going to be this upcoming season. Trying to think of what what record we'll need to be in the Super Bowl. So I'm going to go. <laughs> uh, so I was a big Kenny Pickett fan because he came out of my alma mater, yep. University of Pittsburgh. So yep. when he left, I was a little I was a little heartbroken. But they really reloaded. So I think they're gonna. I think it'll be five losses that'll get us that'll get us through the playoffs of the Super Bowl. Okay. All right. You did it, man. You made it through the mile marker minute. That's it. 
Ted, it was so great chatting with you today. You dropped a lot of really valuable insights and knowledge about building your firm over, over the course of time, about client onboarding, about technology, uh, and the challenges that you have there. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us and with the Connected Advisor community. Oh, absolutely, Kyle. Thank you very much. That was that was that was a lot of fun. If there's uh, if there's another subject, as long as it's not the pirates, uh, you know, let me know. We can uh, we can uh, we can get together again. That'd be fun. Sounds great, Ted. Thank you so much again. All right, everybody. This has been another episode of the Connected Advisor. Please do make sure to click follow or subscribe wherever you're listening to this, so that you can catch the next episode when it airs. But until then, I hope you have a great week, and we will see you next time.